Hello. Good to see all of y'all. Well, not physically, but you know, kind of whatever this experience is. My name is Ian Anderson. I am a staff machine learning engineer at Spotify. I've been here about eight years. I'm currently in New York. So uh, sorry that I can't meet a lot of y'all who are in San Francisco in person at the happy hour. Please enjoy it for me. My goal with this talk when I was uh, chatting with the Arise folk is I have a particular view on how talks are done. And I think that there's an element to it where we will dive really deep into the technical details or we'll talk about it at a really high level, but there's this big squishy in between about how one can influence the other and vice versa. Uh, and this is a, an area that I'm familiar with and uh, something that I care deeply about. So my goal is to just kind of talk through embeddings and how hard it can be and the experiences that I've had with some of the problems that maybe you've already run into yourself. By the way, I cannot see any questions at this point in time from hop in. I'm just kind of presenting from my screen. So I will get to the questions afterwards. It's nothing about you all in particular. So first up, a couple of clarifications. Uh, if y'all are uh, ML practitioners, this should be kind of easy peasy. But when I'm talking about embeddings, I just mean broadly latent representations of information. So this could be images, this could be video, this could be any number of different media. Of course, it could be text. What I'm going to talk about mostly in this, this talk is uh, audio only, but I'm not going to really dive into digital signal processing. If I did, we'd be here all day. It's a fascinating subject. I unfortunately do not have the time. <laughs> and of course, when I'm talking about Spotify, uh, to give an idea of the scale, um, we have over half a billion monthly active users. We are in about 180 markets. I think it's like 183. It's over 180. I don't remember the exact number. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, and then our catalog is over 100 million music tracks and then 5 million podcast titles or shows that each have their own set of episodes. Um, and although I am mostly here to talk about the algorithmic side, I did want to call out that from an experiential level, uh, the whole ex idea is to blend editorial information. We have this wonderful group of people who are deeply familiar with the culture and bringing that into our algorithmic pro uh, process is how we really pull everything out. But I am here to talk about embeddings. And when I first came here back in 2015, they looked a little something like this. So in the long ago time, uh, embeddings uh, have existed for, of course, a long time. But when they first became kind of critical to our understanding of how Spotify should work was with this idea of Discover Weekly. So Discover Weekly is this playlist that any user can come in and it will recommend new music for you that you haven't listened to before. Under the hood and the actual history of it is it started as a Hack Week project. It's probably our most famous or infamous, depending on your opinions about Discover Weekly, um, Hack Week project that has then gone into development. The idea is pretty simple. You take something like Word to Vec, we have this idea of playlists, and then you can learn an understanding of music. So it's pretty analogous. Words are to documents is what you would use in any NLP technique as tracks are to playlists. So that gives you your base embeddings. Then you need to be able to have a way to retrieve from there. We developed a NOI, uh, Eric Bernardson developed a NOI to do approximate nearest neighbor lookup. And this allows you to take an entity and look around that entity to find other tracks that are related. But there isn't a user in there yet. So the naive way was to just construct a user embedding based on a prior listening and then filter on top to get rid of anything that you'd previously listened before. And to this day, this is still broadly how Discover Weekly works. But where it became uh, important is it changed our understanding about how recommendations should work. And I believe the, the history of recommendation systems and embeddings are kind of lockstep with one another. And I wanted to use that as a couple of examples to say where these problems can happen, where things go wrong, and my experiences with you know, trying to solve them. I'm going to try to put some levity on it. So as it stands now, uh, this is a totally incomplete list of things that we are working on at the moment. But the most obvious next step would be like, well, what if we just release another playlist? So we had Discover Weekly in 2016. 
we came up with Release Radar. So it's looking at new releases by artists that you follow or are otherwise interested in. Um, there were, of course, established recommendation systems. So radio stations, uh, of course, exist even from terrestrial days. Um, the idea here being, I just want to listen to music. I know it has to be Taylor Swift <laughs> and people of that ilk. Uh, that's what I'm interested in right now. And those radio stations are increasingly relying on things like embeddings. Um, search, this feels like a no brainer, right? You have uh, off the shelf solutions like Elasticsearch, or maybe you do vector lookups, and this gets integrated into your platform as something that you can do for quick retrieval of specific entities. But it gets broader than that, especially when you're thinking about ideas of semantic search. Well, I don't know that I want Taylor Swift or Girl in Red, but I want something folky. Um, what does that look like from the system's perspective? And then it continues to move beyond the idea of music, or at least it gets a lot narrower. So first, this is just my own personal preference about showing that these are things that exist. So this is recently announced niche mixes. So if you really want to know what sad pirate music is or bubble grunge or goblin core, the world seems to be moving continuously in this idea of smaller niche, smaller communities, uh, hashtags and what have you. And developing in that requires a lot of reproducibility, scalability, and uh, dynam dynamism that you won't see elsewhere. And of course, the, the kind of more grandiose thing is what we've been talking about and announcing in the last couple of months, which is a more totally generative experience. So you have a DJ that will both introduce music to you, that will talk to you in kind of a tone of your choice and will make recommendations. So it knows your taste, it adopts to your taste, and then also has the ability to explain why things are there for you. And as a, an experience, it seems pretty appealing. But each of these highlights a different challenge with embeddings when we talk about them within large scale systems. And this expands not just beyond recommendation or it expands beyond recommendation systems. Of course, it's important in recommendation systems, but I think the implications that I'm going to talk about are, are far beyond that. So first, let's talk about uh, release radar. So as I already said, the idea is to deliver new releases every single Friday. This is a flagship product when we talk to music labels. Uh, artists really want to get their new releases to their fans as soon as they're available. I think that's part of the idea of a marketplace. Um, our goal is not just to satisfy users and give them the next best thing to listen to, but it's also to try to create a sustainable environment for creators. And this is one way that we can kind of build that contract. But there's a bit of a challenge here. So I had said before that we could just use off the shelf kind of NLP things, but you know, music isn't really like language. In fact, it, it has this cold start and long tail problem that yes, this does exist in language, but it's exaggerated. So the vocabulary for a language is let's say hundreds of thousands to millions of words. Maybe you can reduce that down to sub tokens and kind of condense it a little bit, but that's about what you're talking. You can't truly reduce a song or necessarily a podcast down to a smaller entity. So if you view them as atomic, then we're talking about a vocabulary that's 100 million, that potentially could go up to hundreds of million. And compared to language, language doesn't change too terribly often, whereas music changes every single day. And this is actually a, my two second argument as to why music is not language. In language, the most popular words are the, uh, in English that is, or the, a, an, you know, meaningless stop words. That's not true <laughs> with music. You will have quickly emerging words or word equivalences that you really need to learn quickly. You need to understand them in a reasonable time frame, or else you kind of risk the onslaught of, of Taylor fans. But there are solutions here. So one thing you could do is just static version. You can say, this is what it is, and I'll keep it as that. It doesn't really solve the idea of these new releases problems, OK? Well, what we have tried also is you use content aware of embeddings. You take understanding about the music itself. You look at the spectrogram. You look at the potentially like beats per minute or the assumed uh, intent, the mood, the kind of activities that are associated with it. 
And that can inform your cold start problem before you even get any user signals. The longer term solution is more something like warm start, that you have some big training that you have done, and then you update every single day with deltas to account for the idea that the concept of what music is important can change over time. And that piece actually brings me to the next part, which is this idea of conceptual shift in what I'll call batch alignment. So if we think about it from a radio station perspective, um, on Spotify, you can make a radio station for basically any entity. If you take an album, you take a playlist, you can make a radio station off of it. And it understands that this artist has a certain relationship with a vast array of music and will populate it with uh, new elements that are in of a similar ilk. Um, but what happens when there are exogenous events? So these are some recent examples of songs that you would believe are established and have been around for decades. And then you'll have either a meme that pops up in the case of Dreams or Stranger Things in the case of Kate Bush or the Batman in case of Something in the Way. All of these songs had previously established understandings and then their definition changes effectively overnight. This is again, not something that truly happens in language. You'll get new words, you'll get reinventions and, and uh, modifications of existing words, but not at this speed. Um, so you have to consider things like, well, what happens when the concept of an entity changes in kind of a radical fashion? And then there's the extreme version of this where you can totally misalign the batches. So in this case, the understanding of music. And this is a real story. We at one point recommended Thai pop music to a huge portion of the world because one embedding space was incompatible with another. So when we were looking up neighbors and then projecting back into the space for whatever reason, we found a lot of Thai pop music. And it was of course corrected, but uh, these are the sort of catastrophic examples that you can account for. So what do you do as uh, an ML practitioner to solve or deal with these sort of problems? So this builds on top of the last piece with a uh, warm start, but the easiest solution is of course, looking at additional evaluation and monitoring. The more things that you can measure, the more that you can understand from different slices, I think that the more valuable and the easier it becomes to keep track of problems over time. For the batch misalignment piece, what we found to be the most uh, useful changes are tightly bounding our schemas together. So having an idea of batches and having pre-definitions that it's something you need to care about. And uh, all of your systems, and more importantly, your engineers should be aware of these problems. These are not easy problems to notice uh, unless you are aware that these spaces can change. And finding them after the fact without having that understanding may take you days. And at least at the scale that we deal with, that's not really something that's going to be acceptable. But OK. These are solvable problems. Um, let's expand it a little bit from just a specific radio station, a specific user to the more generic. So now we're talking about search. And there's one thing that you probably didn't notice, but I bet that if you go into Spotify now, it's gonna look a lot differently than any other search engine. If you go to any other search engine, there is query autocomplete. Spotify search currently works differently. Every character you put in changes the results. So I have this animation on the side that uh, in real time, we are returning more and different personalized candidates. And this is an extremely tight problem. So you now have to deal with a model and inference of, of whatever construction that you want that needs to deliver within maximum 100, maybe 150 milliseconds. This is not a space that, as of today, generative problems could solve. Uh, it takes too long. I mean, look, I love having as many GPUs as I possibly could, but this is not the space that that particular problem would be well suited for. But it's actually not just the tight latency problem with search. Um, you also have to worry about the vast amount of data that you're pushing into this entire system. So at Spotify, we process trillions of logs a day, um, both in terms of things that are emitted and things in the past that we need to account for. So 
uh, there's this idea of having an efficient record of information. And not everything is going to be important over time. If you naively take everything everyone has ever listened to, you're not going to meet this first constraint of latency. And you're going to run in, into myriad of problems because some people will listen to a couple songs a day and some people listen nonstop. And another problem that occurs that's probably a bit more specific to the music domain is this idea of long memory. Um, podcasts, topics, news, these are not quite, but more ephemeral. Um, we can all talk about what is happening in the world right now. And yes, we will look at things and of course our present is determined by history, but music's a bit different. Music kind of embeds itself inside of your brain and becomes part of your identity. So you need to not just have, well, I'll take the last 30 tracks, last hundred tracks you've listened to. You need to have a much longer term understanding and doing that efficiently is very difficult, at least at the costs that uh, would be not prohibitively expensive. So how do you solve that? Well, actually the solution is to go even harder into embeddings because the first thing deals with latency. Um, as I said before, latent representations of information are necessarily reduced. They should be as tight as they possibly can. It's dimensionality reduction. It's taking signals and reducing it to something core and providing that to an experience that you can do much quicker. And there are entire companies that deal with the retrieval of uh, embeddings in sub 10 milliseconds, sub millisecond, even in some case time. Uh, past that, if you go into this space on your own, um, this might mean probabilistic data structures. So I said before with Discover Weekly, well, we'll just filter out what you had previously listened to before. Keeping track of that full stop isn't going to cut it. So you can use things like bloom filters, you can use hash mapping, those sort of uh, situations is uh, well tuned to making these things work at billion-ish users a month. Um, of course, there's a continuation of approximate re retrieval. You can use ANN techniques in order to get nearest neighbors and get vaguely in the space. This becomes a little bit more relevant when you're talking about semantic searches, as I referred to before. And then I've personally been a fan of this idea of event-driven architecture. So as search exists now, uh, and as you can look at it here, every time you put in a new character, another call is sent to the ranking architecture. But you don't need to reinterpret the entire world that you have experienced up to that point to produce a user history. You can have an idea, a representation of a user's connection to your product or uh, the world in general um, and have that be driven that when something has happened, you push that out into the world and then search can just pick it back up. This is just event-driven architecture. And at the end of the day, a good amount of ML ops is just leaning into data engineering, but with a little bit more math. So you have this problem. We've already hit scale. We've hit conceptual problems. We've hit the idea of just generalized evaluation. Uh, in our case, it, it gets more complicated still. So the next stage, and this is where a lot of uh, other folk that have been talking today and will be talking later today and tomorrow are, are, are leaning into. I've mostly been referring to music. But of course, it's not just music. We don't just make music. I give a couple of examples here. So yes, there's these weird niche <laughs> uh, mixes, like egg punk mix. I do not know what that means, to, to clarify. I didn't sit down and, and code these things. But you could also come up with a, an experience of pulling out podcasts that are relevant for you and making that sort of discovery more relevant. Um, there's the generative experience that I was talking about before with your DJ that kind of is a partner that follows alongside you. When you move into other parts of audio content, then you need to have a much broader global understanding. So podcasts are both fictional, there are episodic podcasts, and uh, news-based or, or ephemeral. They have interpretations of the world. And not all of this, much to my chagrin, is included within the podcast themselves. Or as we move into audiobooks, um, it's the same kind of situation. Uh, you don't 
necessarily have all the context there. Maybe there's a long running fictional story that you just need to lean into a bit. So this idea of generalized global understanding and text-based understanding, I think is growing in importance. There's this problem of text to speech and speech to text. So we do produce uh, AI generated um, voices that are available in things like your DJ. And then of course we have transcripts that are produced from podcasts themselves. But specifically with an art domain, it actually goes a little bit broader than that. And for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go into everything, but I'll give one quick shout out for uh, prosody, which is this idea of it's not just what is said, but it is how it is said. And when we look at things purely through text, while it is true that you can do uh, tasks like semantic understanding, the idea of prosody is, is not there. The fact that I'm speaking to you, you have an understanding of the tone of my voice and the attitude that I'm kind of trying to profess right now. That's not something that will necessarily come through if you read the transcript of this meeting. So the challenges here uh, is first and foremost, it becomes this overload of combinatorics. So you're not just dealing with music, you're dealing with podcasts and audiobooks, and now you have to connect them to home and search. And, and different experiences. And we, we call this the idea uh, content soup, that you have so many different types of content that you end up getting a, effectively a tensor product between a feature that is delivering something to a user and an understanding. And uh, from an efficiency perspective, from a cost perspective, it just doesn't make any sense. And search as it is, is already tricky enough with music. How do you solve this for trending topics? How do you solve this with longstanding uh, books um, the bigger problem, or not the, the bigger problem, but a common problem that you'll see from the generative domain is this idea of trust and safety. So when you lean into multiple domains, not just music, but podcasts, you open yourself up to additional experiences where there's this idea of trust and safety, or at least there's an expectation uh, of the users and the advertisers and the creators that they don't want their content to be associated with other content. How do you measure these things? And actually, I think the more important question is not just the measuring, but what would your escalation policy be? If you have an expectation that a piece of content that you view to be uh, violating in some terms of service needs to be removed in one hour, how would you remove that from a large language model in that amount of time? What would your solution be here? Uh, there are are a myriad of ways that you could do this, but there are pros and cons to each of them. And lastly, I think uh, as you continue to move into multiple tasks, multiple domains, these systems can become overbloated. And you get to the point where single tasks end up being like this idea I have internally of uh, artisanal ML. And when we're trying to develop a model to solve a single task, and we're not training it on other tasks or using pieces of this or reusing pieces of other models, then it's as though you are sitting down and determining that this problem requires individualized attention. And some tasks should be specifically to themselves. Monetary forecasting, uh, potentially some of these trust and safety issues. Uh, you could talk about things like privacy and considerations within that. Maybe you'll want to do that as a single task, but the way to do this at scale is to lean in to this idea of multitask. So how can you expand it beyond the things we are taught at various schools? Well, here is how you do a regression. Here's how you do a classification. The solutions, I think this is still kind of a nascent area somewhat, um, but in my assessment, the first thing you need to do, and I know that I've been harping on is standardizing evaluation. If you don't have evaluation, either for even the trust and safety thing, but the efficiency piece, the being able to generate solutions to multiple tasks, if you don't have that, you don't really have anything. And it becomes very difficult, or at least I've seen those, to argue that you need to move into a more efficient setup when you don't have numbers to kind of back that up. And as scale becomes more and more important, cost is definitely a part of it but cost is not always going to be every part of every conversation. 
So having a standardized framework of evaluation really gets everyone speaking the same language. Of course, I think strongly that the idea of foundation models is where we are moving as an industry. Um, I use foundation models as a more generic umbrella. I think LLMs could be a part of that, will be a part of that. Um, but I believe that, especially when we're talking about these things around music, which are maybe language-based, but not entirely. We talk about the idea of users and recommendations where you could get LLMs into that space, but you need to expand your definition. Um, I'm using foundation models as, that's my bet. I think going forward, that's uh, a strong bet that we'll have these core models that develop the things that we want to do in the world. And lastly, I want to talk about uh, decomposability as a possible solution. When you have this problem, so I'll give the example of this DJ that we generate for, for folk. Um, you can decompose that into different pieces. So yes, there is a generative text-to-speech element, which will take uh, understanding of the next chunk of music, summarize it potentially, then produce some uh, audio for it in text-to-speech. But you can make that its own bespoke system. And you can have that build on top of existing personalized experiences. And it gets deeper than that. You can have the evaluation as its own decomposed layer. The serving as its own decomposed layer. Once you hit a certain scale, this is really the only way forward. Uh, this idea of platforming and, and finding ways to make these available to your entire company and then anybody who might be using your particular stack. And I'm talking about this mostly from a B2C perspective, but B2B would also make sense here. So if there's anything that I wanted to get across from this history, this is kind of just a lesson of what I've experienced, what I've seen, and what I think is most important. Embeddings have not just shifted my neck of the woods, but I think it's clear from the presentations already today and what we're gonna be seeing in the next couple of months and years, the entire industry has changed. I think this is, kind of goes without saying. On the one hand, so I just use these two examples, on the left, you see that this is just the ANN benchmarks. So Eric Bernardson, who came up with Annoy back in 2014, uh, now runs a benchmarking website where multiple companies, Google, Microsoft, Meta, have submitted their own state-of-the-art models to try to do uh, standardized evaluation to see who can do the best at these sort of recall uh, compared to queries per second. And you want to be up and to the right. So the faster you can do it, and then the better those results are, the easier it becomes to use these sort of things. But it's not just the serving side and how we get these vectors or, or embeddings in front of users. Of course, and I know y'all have probably seen this, this is the, the GPT architecture, like a reduction thereof. Um, but inside of that, it's again, embeddings. At the end of the day, it's a very efficient way to transfer information around. So if there's one question that I have uh, as we move towards the next stage, it's in this new generative era, what of this past should we hold on to? Not all of it is gonna hold, but I think some of it might, and it would be a shame if we just let that go. Thank you. Okay, I'm now gonna move over and see what the questions are. I'm going to go from the top So Roy's question, how do you tackle distant discovery with embeddings? Uh, <laughs> this is, there's a couple of ways that you can do this. Uh, the ways that I would lean into would be multiple candidate generators. There was a paper by Michael Jordan in the last couple of years that talks about the, I, you know, the connection between um, one stage and two stage rankers and looking at candidate generation sources. And I think the more diverse your set of candidate generators, the easier this problem becomes. Um, now, I could prattle on forever to say that the idea of a user uh, is, let's say, complicated. Um, and there's a lot of thought that I think we have put into this uh, idea of where a person exists within music space and what that looks like. Uh, I think I will try to take one more question, uh, but if somebody ends up cutting me off, 
Ah, okay. <laughs> so it seems like we only have uh, about a minute left. What I will try to do, and thank you all for, for attending, for asking these great questions, I will uh, answer the rest of these in Slack, if that's preferable. And of course, I'll be on Slack for a while. If you have any further questions, I'm on there. This is my contact information. Thank you again so much.